passage this morning um, sounds like a report from a medieval torture chamber, isn't it? Cutting off hands and feet, eye gouging, drowning, burning in fire. Aren't we supposed to talk about justice, inclusion, children, and embrace? Why does Jesus bring together the themes of greatness, humility, leadership, power, hospitality, inclusion, and then self-mutilation and judgment. And why does he wrap these things in a vivid language of striking and disturbing symbolism? Well, this passage is actually an introduction, an introduction to what we call a discourse on the church. If you read the Gospel of Matthew, you have these five big parts to it, or five big discourses, or five big teachings of Jesus. And this is the fifth one, the final one, the extended teaching on the church. And Jesus starts his conversation about community of faith by bringing some important questions up. What is the place of power in the community of faith? What is responsibility? And what is true servanthood? And Jesus uses all this imagery to tell us something about a vision, a vision of community of faith, and tell us something about the principles of the kingdom of heaven. And to illustrate that, and to start this important conversation about the church, he places a little child in the middle. Disciples came to Jesus and said, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? By formulating this question in this kind of a general term, well, who is the, well, you just want to know who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. They're actually trying to disguise something, a concern for their own status, for their own power, and for their own authority in the community of faith. But this issue of authority of the 12 doesn't come out of blue. If you read the Gospel of Matthew, you will already discover that Jesus in chapter 10 has given them power and authority to, to go and proclaim the Gospel. But also, in chapter 16, Peter there was the one who, who confessed who Jesus truly is. You know, you are the Messiah. But also in chapter 17, Jesus takes three disciples, Peter, James, and John, and goes up to the Mount of Transfiguration. But when he comes down, the rest, the rest of disciples, now are disciples trying to heal a boy or perform an exorcism and fail to do it. And so we arrive to chapter 18, and they all want to know, out of their experience, who is the greatest? of us all. Who is the greatest? Peter? The transfigurational trio? Or the rest of us, the twelve? And we're like sitting here and like, why on earth do you want to ask that at all? What's going on here? Why do you want to even know who is the greatest? What's, 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 what's behind it? What's going on here? Well, their question is actually reflects something, something that is deeply rooted in ancient Middle Eastern culture. And, and what is rooted is, particularly in man, is desire to get into the position of power. And particularly for these guys, who were the 12 in the real world, in the ancient world? Who were they? Well, they were just peasants. There, was, there were nobodies in, in terms of social standing. There were fishermen from Galilee, provincial, simple folk. And now they were given authority in the kingdom of heaven. When they asked later, they would ask Jesus, Jesus, can we sit on the right and the left hand from you in glory? When you come to heaven, you king, I want to be your vizier. I want to be a new 
prime minister. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> so they're coming from, the, from nobody, social nobodies. They want to climb the ladder of power. They want to get to the top of the pyramid of power and sit there and rule and tell people what to do. That's the cultural drive for power, for honor, for authority, for respect. Jesus looked at them. I saw him smirking. And to illustrate his answer to them, to these men who want power and authority, he brings a child, a little child, and places in their midst. I want to see this 12 standing in a circle, wanting power and authority, and there's a child in the middle. The physical presence of the little person, as versus great person that they wanted to be. That em this little person was embodying social insignificance and indifference to the issues of greatness and power and authority. This act of placing a child in the middle challenges disciples' cultural assumptions, challenges this rat race for power and demonstrates radical nation, notion of the kingdom of heaven. Well, for us, like appearance uh, of the child is perhaps not striking because, you know, in modern, modern culture, we pay attention to children, we even pay attention to their rights. Well, at least on, we paying by our mouth, we are claiming that. But, and of course, our modern notion of childhood is actually rising from the 19th century. It is a rise in the 19th century, we started to pay attention to, you know, psychological development of children, the rise of uh, kids' literature, and so on and so forth. But in the ancient world, it wasn't the case. In the ancient world, it's a, in our modern world, we have this romantic picture of childhood. When Jesus, when, when ancient people bring children to Jesus, we're like, oh, so sweet, isn't that nice, so cute. But those are not attitudes in the ancient world. Well, and growing up in the ancient world is a quite a, quite a, well, adventure, disease, Malnutrition, violence, abuse, hard work, and other factors have contributed to the high rate of children mortality. 60% were dead by the age of 16. And over 70% of children would have lost one or both of their parents before they reach adolescence. Without any system of social security, apart from the network of your relatives, Children and orphans took their place alongside the other vulnerable members of the society. Look, but there is more. The Greek word for a little child, it's called pais or paido, paidion, can also could be translated as a slave. It's the same word that, uh, that it's child and a slave. Thus, children had a low social status, particularly in the Greek or Roman world. In that context, the head of household has absolute authority. A man has absolute authority over his children. He could sell them into slavery or even put to death. At will, you can kill your child and nothing would happen to you because your child is your property. Well, like your wife in those days. And so they had no property rights. They, um, there was the practices of abandonment of children over and killing them of unwanted infants. And so this completes the picture of the weakest and the most vulnerable members of the ancient society. Children had their place in the ancient world. And the place was at the bottom of the pyramid of power. And so, when Jesus takes this ch little child, social nobody, a victim of somebody's will, man's will, and places in the middle of group of men, this is, this is a prophetic action. 
This is something that transforms their perspective on things. It signals rearrangement of the social order and accepted values that comes with the inbreaking of the kingdom of heaven. Those found on the fringes of the ancient society now at the center of divine attention. Child in the middle highlights inadequacy of disciples' concern and disciples' drive for power and position to climb at the, to the top. Child in the middle is a vision of a community of faith where cultural tables are overthrown. The pyramid of power puts on its head where those on the fringes take central place where powerless are being served by those who think that they have power and authority. Thus comes the warning to the 12. Unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. They have to change, repent, or turn around, change their mindsets and attitudes towards leadership and the status of honor in order to be part of God's work in this world. Disciples of Jesus cannot be driven by human agenda of greatness and in the same time expect successful participation in the life and the mission of the new holy people of God. Matthew emphasizes that it's important not only to receive the kingdom like child, but to be like one, recognizing own insignificance vulnerability and powerlessness in the face of God Almighty. I want us pause for a moment. And I want you to think of children in your life. Who are they? Name them in your mind. Say a short prayer for them. Take a moment. There is a child in the middle of the group of men, and Jesus tells them, whoever, whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The disciples have to learn something, not just to look at that child, but they have to learn something from that child. And so what do they need to learn? Well, if you want to be great, you need to become like this little one. You need to Humble yourself. What does it mean to humble yourself? Well, in the ancient world, it meant something that giving up your own social status to accept undeserving and even inappropriate treatment and to give honor to others. For the twelve, it implies more than just a, max, a mental exercise of humility. Oh, I'm just thinking of myself as a, as a humble and serving or whatever. Um, you know, I'll just speak softly or do something. It's not about that at all. For the twelve, it comes close to humiliation. They wanted to achieve. They wanted to be at the top. But now, you need to humble yourself. You need to get all the way down to the top of to the, down to the um, pyramid of power, accept the low social status, which is symbolized by this little child. Jesus asked to put aside this culturally fueled concern for self-value, power, authority, and honor, and reorient oneself to a position to akin to one of a child and servant to the lowest and vulnerable status. So, who is the greatest then? The one who renounces the pursuit of honor, humbles oneself, and be prepared to be treated like a child. 
and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. The true greatness and honor in the kingdom of heaven comes through humility and renunciation of one's importance. In spite of Jesus' stern warning, this radical reorientation is hard to accept. And if you read the gospel further, you will see that disciples constantly struggle to accept that position of servanthood. And Jesus at the end would have to say, look, if you want to be in position of power, you need to follow me. You need to embrace and even to the point of death. Because I came not to rule, but to serve and to give my life for others. And this is a true meaning of greatness. That is your serve others to the point when you're prepared to give your life away. This is a true humbleness. And this is hard to accept. How to lead, how to be a leader within a community of faith and lead out of position of powerlessness, vulnerability, and servanthood. This is a big questions for us to grapple with. By placing a little child in the middle, Jesus subverts fundamental cultural assumptions of ancient Mediterranean society by questioning the notion of honor and shame, social positioning, great ones, little ones, upgrade, downgrade. He questions the, their ideas of greatness and humility and what it means to be a servant. He calls to renounce obsession with self-importance and take self-denial seriously. The new leaders of the holy people of God are to reflect the values of the kingdom of heaven and challenge widely accepted cultural patterns. That is what they need to learn from this child in the middle. I want you to take pause now. And think of children in your life. But also, what can you learn from them? What can you learn from these little ones in your life? Take a moment. And now Jesus moves to the final part of his teaching. So how's this new greatness? How's this servanthood? How's this new leadership? How's this new community of faith look like in practice? What does it mean to be great in the kingdom of heaven? And he gives his answer. Whoever welcomes one such chi little child in my name welcomes me. The twelve should demonstrate their humility by welcoming a little child like this. And this is about inclusion. Inclusion, those who are insignificant in this world, those, those who are, have nothing to offer. This is about including and welcoming this act of hospitality, paying attention, embracing. And the leaders of the whole new holy people of God should extend their care and protection to the most vulnerable in the ancient society. But there is even more. Yes, be nice, include, take care, protect. But by welcoming children, they extend the hospitality to Jesus himself. Jesus himself associates with those who have no power in this world, with the law of the lowest. And this actually comes from the Old Testament tradition. When we read Old Testament, we see that there's God's heart and God's concern for the orphans, for children, those who have nobody to protect them. And so God stands with them in a bid to protect and put things right, to protect them in the ancient world because 
they were victims of injustice, of abuse, and they're close to God's heart. So when you welcome, when you accept children within your community, remember, you accept Christ himself. Christ who cares for them so much. So, as the people of God, we, community of believers, are called to imitate God and demonstrate his care, his love to the most vulnerable in this world. But there is other side to that passage, and that's what we're coming to the mutilation part. On the one side, what you need to do is to welcome, extend hospitality. But there are certain things that you should not do to the little ones. And here's something that we need to hear. This disturbing message. This hospitality and welcoming are juxtaposed to not to cause them to stumble. And there's a Greek word that we have a, uh, that our English word scandal coming from. Scandal, what this word is coming to stumble is called scandalizo, to put a stumbling block on somebody's path. Somebody is following Christ, somebody is following Jesus, and you put something on their path and they stumble and fall. So what does it mean? And to be honest, the phrase in itself is not particularly clear. We don't know what it means. But there are a few possibilities. First, it could describe failure in welcoming little ones on the basis of their social status. Well, we're not interested in you. You're not important. We are not, not going to pay attention to you. That's the opposite to welcoming. And so this is a putting a stumbling block to exclude people from the community of faith, not paying attention, to ignore them. That's one thing. The second one is, of course, the mo that what we've heard most about this passage of interpretation. That's, it's about a sin, your personal sin, that you sin and you offend somebody, or you sin against somebody and brings offense, and people stumble and fall and stop coming to the church or following Christ because we've done something wrong to others. And of course, Jesus warns his disciples those are temptations will come and still we can we live in a broken world it's there but be careful well it's not my fault it's the world it's a society somebody else so jesus says take responsibility for what you do how you behave in the community of faith because somebody could stumble and stop following christ be responsible be mindful be careful Live your life in the light of God. Cause them to stumble could refer to any action or sin that prevents these little ones from following, from following Jesus. But there is third possible interpretation of this language. And I must tell you, the most disturbing one. This is, could be interpreted as a dire warning against sexual abuse towards children. The reference to hands, feet, and eyes could be understood as euphemisms for sexual activities. Matthew has already used that language in chapter 5. If you read the Sermon on the Mount, he uses that language where the right eye and the right hand refer to stimulation of sexual desires. Moreover, the Old Testament often uses the word feet, legs, in reference to male or female genitals. That's where the scripture gets kinky. And so the same could be said about the word hand. So, if that's interpreted as that one against sexual misconduct, or even against sexual abuse of children within the community of faith. So, when Matthew says, and Jesus says, scandalizing the little ones, it could refer to that terrible activity. That's why you've got this harsh language that those who do that are deserve drowning in the depths of the sea or throwing into the eternal fire or drowning by touching the heavy communal millstone because this is something that should not have happened in the community of faith cutting off hands and feet is a metaphor of dealing with this sexual temptation at its root, radically, 
removing it. So whatever the stumbling mock is, the 12 must avoid it. And of course, the church these days has faced the reality of sexual abuse of children. And the ugly truth has been uncovered. And those men who are supposed to lead to Christ put stumbling blocks on children's journey to God. And it's hard to hear for us as community of believers, but we as followers of Christ can't turn our faces from this disturbing reality. And we do need to out, out most, do whatever it takes that these things never happen among us. And this passage warns us about that responsibility and consequences. I want to pause and I want us to pray. To pray for children who experience those stumbling blocks in their path following Jesus. And those, maybe for those who still suffering in silence within our communities of faith. Have a silent of prayer for these young people. The child in the middle teaches us a lot. This child in the middle of the community of faith tells us a lot about inclusion, tells us a lot about our responsibility, tells a lot about the power. And this message is very important to hear. And of course, we use this text to demonstrate the importance of inclusion of children in the life of the community of faith, and rightly so. But this passage is not much about children, but about adults, and particularly men in the community of faith. It is about their place, attitudes, and responsibility. The twelve, as the leader of the holy people of God, should serve others, the little ones, with the spirit of respect and hospitality. They also must avoid or remove anything that causes a person or others to stumble in the path of following Jesus. They need to put pride and concern for their significance aside, to renounce the race to power and position, humble themselves, learn from children, surrender, and follow. Follow Christ. And in the context of our modern Western culture, the placement of a child in the middle might not appear to be a strong prophetic action, but it sends an unsettling message for modern Christians nonetheless. First, Jesus teaches to challenge unspoken assumptions about leadership within the, the church that often unconsciously appropriates practices and values from the wider culture, from the wider world, that of world of business or tribal cultures or ideologies. The community of Jesus' followers ought to be built on the subversive principles of the kingdom of heaven, inclusion, servanthood, placing the powerless, marginalized, vulnerable, those who are the closest to the heart of God at the center of communal life of the people of God. Second, it sends the message of embracing the position of powerlessness and vulnerability. This message might be troublesome for our middle class communities of faith who wholeheartedly embrace the corporate ideas about success, prosperity, management, but this ancient notion of humility uncompromisingly clashes with the modern obsession with reputation, claims to own rights, appeals to entitlements, and clinging to privilege. Third, the, this passage calls us to abandon quests for raising one's social position at the church's expense by getting into the leadership 
within the communities of faith and rising from the bottoms of the so social society to the top. And the fourth, the most important one, all of these culturally driven concerns should be put aside and focus should be placed on serving each other in humility, regardless, regardless any social, ethical, gender or cultural boundaries. Placing a child in the middle is a vision of a community of the holy people of God who are called to serve each other, live together a serving community that values each other, encourages each other, recognizes each other's gifts, and helps each other to live out our individual and communal calling in this world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.